Good afternoon and welcome back after a delicious lunch with great desserts and a chance to enjoy the much improved weather from yesterday. Um, we're all glad to see some nice crisp fall weather. I'm Kathy Crow from UNC Greensboro and it's my pleasure to introduce our second keynote speaker, Timothy Owens. And we are so glad that he's here in person today. Um, you have a bio of Timothy in your uh, in your program, so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, just to say, he is our assistant state librarian here in North Carolina. He has spent most of his career in North Carolina, except for a stint at the IMLS. Um, and so we're really glad that he is back here. I asked Timothy for a few non-work-related things that he could share. And so in addition to his professional accomplishments, Timothy is also a pianist and organist, and he was the first male graduate of the Masters in Music program at Meredith College. Um, in his free time, he enjoys biking and hiking, and, oh no, biking and baking. Mm. I think we needed more of that today. We don't have enough sweets. Um, and he, in fact, was the two-time winner of the Golden Whisk for Bake Offs at IMLS. He's also, this is very impressive, he's also been skydiving and I highly recommend it. So I think I will not take up that recommendation myself. But he is here to talk to us about making sense and making change. So please welcome Timothy Owens. So thank you everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here today with you. Um, I've been, I don't think of myself really as an entrepreneur, so it was nice to, but it was nice to get that invitation from Michael Crumpton to have the chance to talk with you today. There are three things really that I want to do. Talk a little bit about the current environment, what I see in the world in libraries. Talk about data, which I know I'm supposed to, uh, and give a few tips on that. And then also, I want to provide you with some resources and other opportunities that you may want to consider. Uh, to start with, talking about the, oh, before I dive into that, I do, in the interest of saving trees, so I'm going to talk about a few resources, and I have handouts here that I will just put up front, and you can take pictures with your phone. Or if you're the last one, feel free to take a copy. But the environmentally friendly approach, uh, just to get that out of the way, so that you have those afterward. So I do want to, before I dive into some of my other comments, I want to uh, just follow up on something from Patrick Sweeney's presentation this morning. But, he was talking about the From Awareness to Funding report of OCLC and how voters are less engaged and we're losing those stronger supporters and they're less likely to support uh, and few will, will vote for support. And there are a couple of things at play there. One is people don't understand how libraries are funded. Uh, they don't recognize that, at least for public libraries, it's local funding is the majority, especially in North Carolina. But the other piece is, so they don't recognize that piece, they don't think about it in terms of their local support. The other piece, I think, is moving um, from this point of people like libraries, just to see the second, people do like libraries, but we need to show that libraries are solving problems. That's what really engages people. And I think this is true no matter the type of library that you are with, of whether it's academic, community college, public library. It's, you can make a real connection with the community that you serve by showing that you are engaged in solving problems, solving the needs of the people in that community. So I just wanted to throw that out. Uh, another comment that he made that I wanted to echo was great relationships are based on mutual outcomes. And it's so important that the library is aligned with its host organization, its host ecosystem, whether that is the college that you're serving or the community that you're serving. So just things to keep in mind. Uh, more about another piece of the current environment. 
And this is my information overload. I know I'm preaching to the choir in this part, but there is just an overwhelming amount of information that's thrown at us every day. Um, I read in a Forbes article, there are two and a half quintillion bytes of data produced every day. And that same article said that in the past, that 90% of the data available has been produced in the past two years. So that's, uh, that makes me think back to, a, I don't know if any of you were far side fans, but there was one that, my brain is full, may I be excused? That's kind of how I feel many times. So we do have all of this information coming at us all the time. And on top of that, these days, our communities, our state, the country, even the world are becoming more and more polarized than ever. You see science and education are under attack. And I think that this shows the value of, and importance of libraries more than ever. That it's really greater than it ever has been. Oh, I forget to advance my slides. There's my division. We are you know, polarized. Uh, we've seen the rise of fake news also and alternate facts. And social media platforms that are out there to really make connections with people are also being used to drive um, divisions and to sow discord. And a lot of this is politically driven, but we're also seeing this in popular culture. I just saw an article last week on weaponizing the haters. And that was using uh, fans or of The Last Jedi to drive discord. So here's where I think libraries have this great opportunity. They're trusted institutions. People do like them. Uh, and librarians have always been about helping people make sense of information, make sense of their world, and our power lies in the ability to make change for our communities. And it's in this context that I see this great opportunity for libraries and the entrepreneurial spirit where entrepreneurs are looking for these opportunities, seizing chances to try out new initiatives and introduce new programs. This whole, the whole day here uh, is about sharing some of these ideas and some of this information. And I just think um, it's really critical to make these connections both with your community and also at events like this, making connections with your peers. And also in this, in this line, I think it's more important than ever that we use data and that we use it well to help identify opportunities, manage and improve our services, and also tell the library story. And this, the quote from David Lankis is one of my favorites, and it's not exactly about what I was just talking about, but really, everything we, should, we do should be aimed at the community. We've moved from being just warehouses of information, storehouses of books and knowledge, to making connections, creating services, creating those opportunities to build community. And so now moving on to more talk about data. I will get there eventually, forgive my rambling a little bit to set the stage. Uh, so you don't have to be a data scientist these days to really work with and embrace data. And are there any data scientists in here? If so, I'll probably hand the, uh, the mic off. I was an accidental data librarian, just a little bit from my background. I was the state data coordinator for a, library, a public library survey in North Carolina, and I fell into that after I joined the staff back in, of the state library back in 97. The person who had been in that role resigned. None of the other consultants who were on staff were eager to step into that role. So I became kind of the accidental data library. Just a, another aside. Uh, anyway, there I, I learned, connected with colleagues, uh, learned as I went, and really started embracing data and the power of it. 
And there are so many tools available these days to help folks work with data. Um, and regardless of the tools that you, you know, we have Excel, there are, you can go to more advanced Tableau, there's R, all sorts of tools available that you can explore. I'm not getting into that level of detail. We just have a few minutes here. Um, but I think one of the big things is your approach to data, and that's to bring curiosity to the process. And really, the thing you can think of this as a librarian would, as a reference interview with your data. You know, what do you want to get out of it? What do you want to know? What what other questions are you trying to answer? What sort of information do you already have? What information might you need? And as I was thinking about that, I thought about how organizational culture is important in embracing data. And then I stumbled on the work of Catherine Dignacio and Rahul Bargava. I may have mangled those names, but their contact information is here. And they started a data culture project. Uh, this came out throughout of MIT, but to really get organizations to start embracing and working with data, and also to have all levels of organizations work with data. And here's a little nugget to take away. Uh, if you are interested in sort of shifting your organization's approach to data, look at their toolkit that they produced. There are some tools to use and suggested activities to work with data that they have provided. Uh, I think it's a good way to get people talking about data and more engaged with data. And you might find that very useful. All right, so moving into some tips, um, and this is gonna be pretty high level tips, but very basic information. Um, and mostly I'm gonna focus on presenting information. And you know, we are visual learners. It's so much easier to grasp, especially with numbers, grasp information visually with charts and graphs. Uh, we've seen the rise of infographics. And I think, um, a few factors to keep in mind as you're working with data. It's really critical to think in terms of accuracy, clarity, and context. And as I mentioned before, facts are under fire. So it's really important for libraries and our credibility that when we're using and presenting data, uh, that we make sure that we are being accurate. You know, there's a lot of work going on with digital and information literacy, and I think that ties into this, both using and consuming data. Uh, we certainly want to check our sources, to be aware of the authority of those sources. And another point, when you're presenting data, always cite the sources of our data. I'm starting with accuracy. One uh, point I'd like to raise in thinking about facts and how we present them, present them, and this is from Pew Research. I don't know how many of you have seen this. It was just about a month ago. But large majorities of both parties say voters cannot agree on basic facts. 78% um, of people say that voters can. So when we come at data from that angle, it really is, that it, it's so important, I think, to be credible sources. And it speaks to the, that appreciation of libraries as an institution, but we definitely, when people are doubting facts anyway, want to be sure that we are presenting information correctly. And when we think of how we present data, um, to the public. It's also important to be accurate in the visual display of any information that we're presenting. Um, I want to show, I don't know if any of you have seen this image before, but this is uh, for Reuters in 2014, so it's a little older, but gun deaths in Florida, and it's 
attempting to show the change in gun deaths after the 2005 Stand Your Ground Law. Now the interesting thing, when you, when you first glance at this, and you see 2005 there, the point they uh, raised, and then the line drops right after, it appears, at least in first glance, that gun deaths have decreased following Stand Your Ground. But in this case, if you look at the y-axis over there on the left, zero is at the top, and 800 is at the bottom. So here, it's in fact the opposite. There was a huge spike right after that. So they twisted the scale, and so the information that your brain is processing is telling you quite the opposite story of what the data is in fact doing. So this is a practice that I would not recommend, um, but I think it's fascinating to see how uh, data can be manipulated. Um, we've all heard about what's it, the lies, damn lies, and statistics. And so presenting that, I think there's a real, there's an opportunity to mislead, of course, that you can take into all sorts of divisions. But just something to keep in mind. Um, the one point on these graphs, when you have a y-axis, always start with zero at the bottom. And always have zero, also. It's important just for scale. The scale is another way that graphic representation can be a little misleading. And so I have another example. This is New South Wales and they're showing that they are recruiting more nurses. And you I, I don't I'm sure you can't see the numbers. And this is older. But the first one on the left is forty three thousand. There were forty three thousand nurses. It goes up, you go over a couple of the forty three thousand four hundred and five. So we gained a few hundred, still represented with four people. <laughs> In 2011-12, it jumps to 46,000, but we have added seven rows of the four people. So that scale, and that is just showing an increase of 3,000. So there was barely a tenth, and it goes up to 47,000, the next one. So barely a 10% increase, and they're showing it um, more than, I can't do quick math on that, but like 700 times the impact. So it's really, the scale of this is just phenomenal and distorting the data. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Edward Tufte. Is anyone familiar with Edward Tufte? The visual display of quantitative information, great work. Um, I encourage you to check out his work. There are also workshops. Uh, he has these multi-day events now and then. I guess he still does those. But to assist with this. And this is a case that he would call the lie factor. And it's a tremendous lie factor because the scale that is shown is so much greater than the scale of the actual increase. So just something to keep in mind. Another point I wanted to stress in using this, we talked a little about accuracy, is clarity. And simple, direct approach is so, so much more effective in communicating. And as we talked about, there's so much information coming at you, it's really easy to get lost in a sea of data. Uh, and we. As librarians, we are navigators and facilitators, and so we want to guide people through our data. But clarity is a key in communicating our message. And now back to Edward Tufte, <coughs> he suggests that we avoid chart junk. Uh, that's a phrase he termed, and there are all sorts of um, types of chart junk. But really, even adding 3D effects to charts, can't to bar graphs or pie charts, can distort perspective and have some of that distorted effect on your data. And the 
other point I'd like to make is just because the tool that you're using to produce any of these images can bedazzle and bedeck a graph or a chart or whatever picture of information you're using, um, less is more and you don't really have to use all of those to convey information and a, the simple approach can really help ease uh, user access to your information. And now I'm going to talk just briefly about a few types of charts and again thinking about clarity but this applies to more complex charts. I'm starting with bar charts. And here is a, I think a, a decent image from the Office of State Man Budget and Management. Uh, and this is their projection through 2035 and half of the state's two million new residents in the next 20 years will be 65 plus. And the vertical bars are great if you just have a few, three or four elements. I have another image. When you get into more data points, it's helpful to go um, horizontal with the bars. It's just easier for people to access the information. And this one is showing that two-thirds of NC growth is project projected to occur in the Triangle or in Charlotte. And so this came out of some work, this was with the, uh, the legislature was doing, but we use this in some of our planning. So I think these are, aside from being good examples of presenting information, they also label the percentages so you don't have to hunt around, you don't have to find the mark on the axis. And they've highlighted by color uh, the two really important ones, the Triangle and Charlotte, where we are going to see that tremendous growth. Um, line graphs are another useful tool. Back to the aging of North Carolina's population. By 2035, one in five North Carolina residents will be 65 or older. Again, adding the data points is useful, as well as, you'll notice they do start with zero, so you, get, you can perceive the scale. Um, and we will have a few less than the overall US average of the 65 plus, but that is a growing segment. And just as another aside on the aging of North Carolina, next year there will be more people 60 and over than there will be 18 and under. Um, so it's really the, the landscape is changing here. A little more complicated version, but effective. Here's a stacked area chart, so taking the line graph a little further, again showing the distribution of ages, and there at the top you can see the sort of lighter green is the 65 to 84 year old population, and that's going to be, uh, that's population will be greater uh, up to 20% again by 2035, and the 85 plus is the fastest growing segment, uh, age segment of the population. So just another, but line graphs anyway are great for showing change. There are some other versions of this that you can explore. Uh, then to everyone's favorite, the pie chart. Now they get a bad reputation. People say avoid the pie chart. This is one of my favorites. I think it's pretty clearly presented. I could not feel, I couldn't find the source of this, so I apologize. I know I said always cite the source, but I couldn't find the origin. So if you know it, if you know it, please let me, let me know. So pie I have eaten and pie I have not eaten. Just a couple of segments. Uh, pie charts are great for showing parts of a whole. So if you have, say, fixed survey response, yes, no, maybe. Pie charts great at quickly showing that. If, however, you have, you're, say, um, showing some survey results and you have multiple choice items, pie charts don't really work as well because then you could end up with 250% 
in your pie. So be sure that it just adds up to 100% when you're doing the pie chart. And also, speaking of segments, here's another favorite one. Uh, this is uh, state uh, population of states in the U.S. So you see California has the highest. Now they did go from highest around to smallest as the clock goes. So that's a good point. But with so many segments, it really is useless and does not convey a lot of information. But here is a better example of using pie charts. Again, this was back to a survey, and this is some work from the Library Research Service, which I'll talk about again later, in Colorado, and this was a Read to the Children program and a survey of offenders and caregivers. And you can see there were really just three responses um, to the question, and this pretty accurately gives you a picture that the majority in both cases thought that this had improved the, their relationship with the child. Sort of the last facet of this that I wanted to talk about um, as far as data is in terms of context. And again, getting back to that navigator role, context is what helps put the data into perspective. This is where you can add a story so that your audience can connect with the information. And it can also help make sort of big numbers or big data more accessible to your audience and also personalize it. Um, one, I don't have a visual example of this, but one thing I was thinking of is in terms of some of the public library statistics. We had 3.2 million um, attendees at public library programs in FY 16 and 17. And you know, that's a big number, but putting it into a perspective that some may uh, appreciate, that's enough to fill the Dean Smith Center or the Dean Dome 138 times. So that gives a little context, a little more information that can be used. We also, you've probably heard these uh, talk of there are over 17,000 public library outlets, and that's more than there are McDonald's in the country. So adding some of that context can help you interpret numbers a little better. Uh, there are other ways of adding context that can add the story. For example, the image I showed you earlier about caregivers in the Read to the Children program in Colorado. Here, adding some quotes, personalizes it, gives a little more emotional aspect to it. So they say it was a crisis program with tremendous impact, keeping a connection between my son and his daddy, or each child in the world deserves to know and connect with both parents, and this program helps them do that. So I think really this story, the aspect of story is important, or adding some context to the data. And again, it really is all about um, making it useful for the users. Now, I mentioned infographics earlier, and I think they can be great tools for providing information. Here's a fuller version of the Read to the Children program, because it talks about it both from the perspective of the offenders and the caregivers, gives some other data, but it walks you through very nicely how to access the information and how to approach the information that they are presenting. Um, I'll give you the link again to the Library Research Service. They have a number of different um, infographics that they've used that I think are pretty effective. Uh, I have seen examples, I didn't bring any bad examples of infographics, but there are plenty out there um, that really do more to obscure the information and lose the point. And if you're just overwhelming your user, then you're not doing a service to either the data you're trying to present or the library that you are trying to promote. So again, just a recap of things to think about to do with data. I think start with the data. Here's, um, I don't know how many of you have seen this or heard this before. Robert Bergen, if any of you know Robert, Dr. Robert Bergen, 
uh, he would often wrap up his workshops on data with this quote. Um, using statistics for support can lead you down that path of cherry picking and the confirmation bias and uh, really uh, twisting the data instead of looking at the data. So I think you want to approach the data again with your questions, but be open to the answer. Don't come with a fixed answer as you approach data. And I think it can be used for both support and for illumination. Uh, another point I'd like to make is to always keep your audience in mind, and this goes back to some of that sort of context, think about what you're trying to say, who you're trying to reach with that. One tip there is if you are preparing some data or an infographic, share it with someone who's not involved with you in the development and production of that and see if they get the same message that you are intending to convey to them. And again, uh, the KISS principle, keep it simple whenever possible. Um, it just helps your users. Now, the, so that's all I wanted to say about data. And again, that's really high level, but I, I want to share, I don't feel like I would be doing my job at the State Library if I came in to an audience of librarians and did not share some news you can use from the State Library. Because um, I don't know how often this group interacts. I would like to see a show of hands. How many are from North Carolina? Okay. So there are a few who are not. For those who are not from North Carolina, um, your state does have a state library. Uh, some of the information that I'm going to talk about is available regardless of which state you're from. Uh, and if it's something that the state library is doing just for our libraries, then you may want to go back and talk to your state to see if A, uh, they do that, they offer this, uh, and B, if they don't, then encourage them to consider. And you can point them our way. Uh, so the state library, there are three sections of the state library. There's the library, the government and heritage library, which serves state employees and local history and genealogy researchers. We have the Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, which provides free material to users with print, uh, with difficulties using print materials. And then we have the Library Development section, which is usually more known to libraries outside, um, out in the field, but they provide services to support and enhance and elevate library service throughout the state. Um, one non-data related plug, our Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped turned 60 this year. Uh, since 1958, we've been providing that service. We struggle with identifying this population, so I would like to encourage you, if you do have users with print difficulties in your communities, encourage them to connect with us. Our Library for the Blind can even send you out the applications to get that service. Um, they serve about 12,000 people right now, and the estimate is that that is only 10 out uh, of 10% of the eligible population. So we want to develop that audience. And you can see on November 8th, if you're in Raleigh, you can come to an open house to celebrate that event. From our Government and Heritage Library, uh, another plug, you can all, all of the North Carolina residents can get a library card with the state library. This took an act of the legislature, but you do have access now. You can do this remotely. I've got a link there. You can sign up online, and you can use some of the electronic resources that we make available. Back to data. Our Government and Heritage Library is offering, is presenting a data day on October 24th. If you're not, if you're in Raleigh, come visit us there. If you're not, you'll be able to live stream this. Promoting our librarians who can help you with data, and we have lots of government documents, lots of information available. You can chat, and this goes for those out-of-staters too. 
um, you can always contact our reference desk. Now here's the, uh, the venture capital portion of this. Um, so the state library does administer the Library Services and Technology Act funds from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Uh, how many of you have received grants before? How many of your libraries have? Okay, the folks who are not raising your hands, I want you to look at those people who have received grants, talk to them, they can talk to you about the, the process, they can give you some tips maybe. Uh, as you're going through the event today, I'd encourage you to think about the programs you're hearing, and maybe there's a way to turn that into a project that you could get some of this federal funding with. Um, we do operate on a five-year plan, and our goals are strengthening capacity, expanding access, and community engagement. Our plan is available online. They're pretty broad goals. I would hope that most of what you do is strengthening capacity and expanding access and community engagement. Quickly on the grant program that's out right now, um, for the 2019-2020 program, which would be projects that would start next July 1, we have two categories of grants. There are easy grants that are between five and $50,000 for a single year project. Those are due in February, February 28th. Uh, then we also have project grants, which range from 50,000 to 100,000 for a single year project, or 150,000 uh, for multi-year projects. That actually has a two-step application process, and the first is a letter of intent that is due in November. So if you're thinking about a larger project, this may be a little tight turnaround but I would encourage you to consider that. And again, 5000 to 50000 is not, uh, not too shabby either and may be able to promote some great service in your library. But think about that. Talk to the folks you saw who have received those grants. You know, R&D in library land is rip off and duplicate. So <laughs> don't be shy and get some sharing some ideas. You know, aren't we all about learning and sharing? Uh, I do want to talk also in our library development section, we have a continuing education consultant, a continuing education program. We provide a number of in-person and online learning opportunities. Web Junction, they have some great data courses, um, data visualization too, um, that you can check out. Be sure to look at those. Now, just to talk about a few sources and resources that may be of interest. Any communi community college libraries here? Ah, great. So the state library funded a, a project, a study actually, that was looking at community college libraries and librarians and student success. And some of the recommendations that came out of that were to develop um, and refine some performance measures. There were some suggestions for professional development. I think this is a great document here to take a look at if you have it. And it could apply also to other academic libraries looking at these measures and the suggestions. And there's already basically a needs assessment done with this document for a potential grant proposal. So I just want to highlight that and the work of those federal funds from IMLS. Uh, we do provide, here's a few, a few data sources. Uh, so the State Library, we have uh, Amanda Johnson is our data uh, analysis and communications consultant. We have a page dedicated uh, with a number of links to data. A lot of data on public libraries, but then some other demographic data. Another great source for data is IMLS itself. I'm not sure if you're aware that they publish, well, they produce the public library survey annually. Um, they have the state library agency, state library administrative agency survey. That's a biannual survey. But they also uh, have other data available. There's a public needs for library and museum services survey. There's museum information. Uh, discretionary grant information. 
Again, you may want to study that. You might also be able to find some ideas for potential projects there. And then there are reports of funding by the state. I mentioned earlier the Library Research Services is out of Colorado. Linda Hofshire is the director there. It's associated with the, Cal uh, the Colorado State Library, supported with federal funds as well. They do a great job. They have data sets for academic libraries, for school libraries, for public libraries. It's a rich resource that I would recommend you explore. Um, Patrick mentioned the Pew Research Center. They have a lot of information about libraries. Uh, Lee Rainey is often on the circuit and does a great job. Some of his presentations are up there uh, for some demographic data on North Carolina. Link, log into North Carolina. Uh, this is through the Office of State Budget and Management. Data, reports, lots of great information. Another one of my favorites is um, Carolina Demography, which comes out of the uh, Carolina Population Center at UNC. Uh, and they have a great blog, and you can sign up for alerts if you're interested in especially demographic information about North Carolina. A great resource to see how the state is changing. And it is changing and will continue to change. Then there's a random picture of my cat. Woo! Um, and we have about two minutes for questions. I really want to thank you all for being here. I could put you, Yuki is her name. Um, any questions, comments? I, I'm sure there's lots of, this was really a skip through, I like to skip through data and some resources, but I hope there are some nuggets that you'll take back and really, if nothing else, well, look at the Data Culture Project, but also look at the LSTA program. We want to see those dollars at work across the state. And that's both my state library hat and if I step back to my old job at IMLS. Yes? Question about the um, library Yes. Is that something that we could send students who are not residents but here in North Carolina because they're attending school in North Carolina? Yes, I think if they would be residents considered, I think, for that, for that point. And one other comment I'll make about LVPH. Um, for the academic institutions, they do provide through, this is a partnership with the National Library Service at the Library of Congress, and they do provide accessible versions of some of the like more common textbooks in colleges. Um, so if you have some print users, for some of the lower level, I, I didn't bring the list of courses that they cover, but they will provide those, and again, that is a resource that's provided for free. Some people don't want to take advantage of it, but could because they think they're taking materials away from someone who may be fully blind, but that's not the case. We want this to be used as much as possible. Other questions? Well, it looks like I may have stopped right on time. So there's that. Thank you all.